Hello, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about uh, demystifying reproducible pills. And uh, yeah, a little bit about me. My name is Rahul Bajaj. Uh, currently, I'm working as a site reliability engineer at Red Hat. I recently completed my, uh, I recently graduated from uh, Queen's University. Uh, and uh, this uh, reproducible builds was my, uh, was part of my, uh, was part of my thesis. So agenda. Uh, so this talk, I have divided this talk into two parts. The first part is which talks about basics of uh, what is a sub software supply chain, uh, what is a software supply chain uh, attack, and uh, what are the some of the conventional practices that do not apply to uh, reproducible builds. After that, uh, we just uh, introduce what is reproducible builds. Uh, so this is part one of the agenda. Let's look at them one after the other. So what is a software supply chain? Most op uh, most open source software in today's era are part of a part of a larger ecosystem like a Linux distribution, and all these Linux distributions are basically made made up of uh, thousands of interdependent packages forming a supply chain. Now maintaining this supply chain because this is an interp interdependent uh, packages and uh, it is not easy to maintain this supply chain. Um, and therefore, a lot of attacks we have seen in the past have occurred uh, in this uh, software supply chain. And these attacks, some of the famous ones are that we know of are SolarWinds and Mimecast, Log4j. This, this is what we know. Um, so what uh, basically we know about a software supply chain attack? In this talk, we would talk about a uh, software supply chain attack in the build phase. So how it happens is, say, for example, you have a source code, and your end goal is to generate a uh, build artifact. In this process, the malicious attacker would um, inject some malicious vulnerability inside a build phase. And that's how a software supply chain attack would occur in this case. Now, some of the conventional uh, you know, security measures are not really sufficient. So say, for example, you would say that uh, the general uh, industry standard is to sign your packages or sign your code that you have. And, um, and that should secure yourself for, from supply chain attacks. Now, Signing your um, uh, using signed versions would is is one of the ways to you know get some uh, get, get some security for supply chain, but it's not the only one. So say for example, your soft your um, developer has created the code. He has he is he's in the build phase, and some malicious attacker introduces a particular malicious in, injects malicious code into the build phase. But even after that, the code will be signed. So even even if the code is signed, it could be um, it could be affected by a by a supply chain attack. Second thing that we hear a lot is uh, we hear people saying that update your software uh, to the latest version. But that's not it, right? Because the latest version could have uh, uh, the supply chain attack. The latest version could have the malicious uh, you know code. The third one, monitor software behavior. Yes, this is a way to identify supply chain attack. But the problem with this is the attack has already happened. It has been a while that the attack has happened until we realize that uh, from the behavior. So this is also not an efficient way. And the fourth is uh, review your source code. So developers review the source code, but there is not much that the developers can do in the build phase. They do not have much insight into the build phase, maybe. And that's why these attacks are possible. So these conventional security uh, measures do provide a, a, a way to you know, mitigate uh, supply chain attacks, but not, uh, not completely. And therefore, the industry is kind of moving towards uh, something called as reproducible builds. What is reproducible builds in simple terms? When I uh, run my build again, I must get the same build artifact. It's, it's, it's in a very simple layman uh, terms. It means that. Now, um, there is this diagram which explains the concept of reproducible builds uh, very well. I have taken it from a research paper, and, uh, and it very well explains the concept. So on the very left side, you see a yellow box. And on the very right side, you see uh, the end goal, that is your uh, software artifact, like your, your build artifact. So in between, you have the build phase. So consider two parts. The first part is the upper one, wherein you have a software vendor. Say, for example, your uh, Linux distribution. So in, in that phase, you take your source code, you perform uh, the build process you, by using the build dependencies and the, uh, and the build tool chain, and you create a build artifact. Now, when you create this build artifact, you basically create a hash for it. 
Now, on the second hand, you perform individual builds. That's the lower one. You take the source code, you build, you perform the build, and then you generate a, a build artifact. Now, if those hashes of both the artifacts performed by the software vendor and one uh, and the one by the independent build, if they both match, then we say that the build was reproducible. Okay, and if they don't match, we say the build was unreproducible. So uh, uh, a mode of uh, inspiration for my uh, research was was by was through this blog by uh, David Wheeler. He said that uh, he said that there is there are few softwares uh, or there are few uh, packages that need to be that that are more crucial and that need to be reproducible before the other packages, right? So in in my in my study, I tried to find out those packages that the pack the, that uh, developers must focus on and make reproducible before others. So we come to the second part of our agenda, which is the study which I conducted. Um, it's called unreproducible builds: time to fix causes and correlation with external ecosystem factors. This is uh, submitted to the Journal of Empirical Software Engineering, and um, it's still in review. Uh, but for today. We will talk about the glimpse of this study. There are three things that we need to understand, I believe, about unreproducible builds. First thing is we need to understand how much time it takes for an unreproducible build. So initially, a package might be unreproducible. How much time does it take for that build to become reproducible for the first time? That is the first thing to understand. And the second thing to understand in this is that once that package becomes reproducible, what are those changes or what are those things that, that are performed on that package that it becomes unreproducible again. So we're trying to calculate the time and the effort that developers might require for a build to become reproducible for the first time, and then the changes that might occur to it again, that it might become unreproducible. That's the first thing. The second thing is we, we perform a quantitative analysis to understand all the issues of reproducibility on, on Debian website, and we try to categorize those issues into a few categories, and they become root causes. And the third one is that, as we mentioned in the beginning, a package belongs to an inter in interdependent uh, ecosystem, belongs to an interdependent ecosystem. So what are those external factors that might affect the reproducibility of a package? To understand that a package is a part of an ecosystem and that only the developers and the maintainers of that package are not responsible for the reproducibility of the package is what we want to understand next. So just to give an idea, we performed these experiments on 18 million builds uh, uh, data until 2021 from the Debian distribution. If you look at the paper, like it, it also uh, compares Arch Linux and Debian and, and compares distributions and things like that. But for this presentation, we would consider only uh, the builds from Debian distribution. So let's look at the first research question. It says, how long does it take for a particular package to become reproducible and vice versa? In Debian, so how we do this uh, is Debian basically uh, creates package domains. Now, what are these package domains? These package domains are groups of packages that Debian categorizes. So say, for example, uh, the admin package domain would have packages that are, that are related to administrative stuff like add user, Ansible, cron. Uh, there are other types of, uh, there are other types of uh, package domains like net, which has net start package. And, and you get the idea, right? Games would have 3D chess and uh, uh, Mario or things like that. So we divide, we categorize these packages into two categories. One is the crucial kind of packages, and the other one is, is the trivial kind of packages. So we found out that if you, if you look at the graph that we've up, uh, obtained from survival analysis, so this survival analysis shows us that how, how long will the package still remain unreproducible, right? So if you see on the top, there is a, there is a, orange curve which uh, represents the trivial packages and uh, below that there is a blue curve that represents the crucial packages. Now at a one year mark, those dotted lines uh, indicate one year mark and at a one year mark you will see that there is a huge difference and that trivial packages are tend to remain unreproducible, unreproducible for a longer time. Now this is good news, right? So crucial packages by developers are given more priority than trivial packages as of today. But however, once they are fixed, right? Once they are fixed, we find we found out that 
trivial packages remain reproducible for a longer time when compared to the crucial packages. Now, one reason for this we, we thought is, uh, we suspect is that crucial packages undergo multiple changes and a lot of changes. And because of these changes, uh, they become unreproducible again and more effort is needed. So for, a conclusion, for, for, for concluding what we have seen till now is that making packages reproducible is not easy. It requires time and that um, currently developers are prioritizing uh, the correct packages to become reproducible at, at a scale. So we move on to the second uh, research question. It says identify issues that lead to unreproducible builds. Right, for this we perform a qualitative analysis and we found that in the previous uh, literature that we have, we found that there are only six root causes that have been, um, that, that have been mentioned. But uh, in our study, we found out, found out that there are, there are 16 uh, root causes and that there are four, which are divided into four major categories. Uh, the first one is build, the second one is file system, third is memory and the fourth is system. So I will go through a few of uh, these uh, root causes and um, because explaining each one is not possible, you can read the paper, but giving an idea of the few uh, which are the most important, let's go with the first one that is from the build, which is the build path. Build path is basically, um, you can say that when two builds are performed on, on distinct machines and when the artifacts are generated, they are generated different, unreproducible because of build path. Now why? Because build in, in, in one of the build path, a relative path was mentioned and in another build path, there was an absolute path given. So this is an example of how builds become, uh, how builds become unreproducible because of build path. The second example would be build timestamp. The, uh, the build timestamp uh, is the time at which the build was actually performed, right? So for two distinct builds, the time would not be similar and the build would be unreproducible. For this, um, the reproducible builds community came up with a flag called as, uh, called as, uh, uh, yeah, source date epoch, which what it does is basically it, it pulls the latest commit hash from the change log, and um, and that that should uh, that should make the builds reproducible. The third one we we'll talk about is uh, file system ordering. The order in which files are, are being displayed may not be similar in in two distinct builds and cause unreproducibility. There is randomness. Randomness is, is basically when you have, say for example in Python 2.7, those data structures like tuples and dictionaries, when you, uh, when you use those data structures, when you display data from those data, data structures, they might display the data in a different order and that could cause unreproducibility. You could use functions like sort to handle those, uh, uh, handle those situations. There is uh, encoding. Uh, so if you encode a particular snippet and that snippet is encoded in different build systems with different encoding mechanisms, then, then the, the builds would be unreproducible. So you get an idea. So there are two build systems that you, that how do you test builds in Debian is you have two build systems and you try to build uh, your software on your packages on those two build systems. And then if you face such errors, your build would be unreproducible. So one of the interesting findings that we found through our research is that previous literature claims that build timestamp is one of the major uh, causes of um, unreproducibility. Whereas we found out that although the frequency of issues by build, build timestamps is more, but uh, the affected packages by build path and randomness are more than build timestamp. Another interesting fact that we found out is that packages might be affected by multiple root causes. And this would uh, make it more difficult for developers to make the builds reproducible. There are two challenges uh, related to this. The first one would be to identify which root causes are uh, you know, causing unreproducible builds. And the second one would be to actually fix them, to identify and then fix more root causes is much difficult than having a single root cause. Our last research question addresses the uh, ecosystem that the package belongs to um, and whether any other uh, ecosystem factor is influencing the package to become unreproducible. So our first um, external factor is called uh, build dependency, is, is the build dependency. Uh, 
So we found out that um, reproducibility of a package might depend on the reproducibility of its build dependency, right? To, to prove this claim, what we did is we found the top 10 most influential uh, build dependencies, meaning that we found those build dependencies which are used most by packages, right? And deb helper and package config were the two most used build dependencies. Now, deb helper, if you see uh, the graph, you will notice that past in the past six years, they have uh, the builds have been reproducible for deb helper. It, it is expected, right? And we have seen that the packages that it builds, and for which it is a build dependency, 85% of the times, uh, they have been reproducible. Whereas in the case of package config, from the past three years, you see the builds are unreproducible. And because of this, we see considerably 25% of the builds to be unreproducible. Uh, the packages which use package config as their build dependencies turn out to be unreproducible. Uh, so this proves our point. One interesting fact that we found is that you guys remember package domains, right? They are categories of packages that Debian defines. So one, uh, one of the things that we notice is that the libdevil package domain consists, uh, the libdevil package domain, whenever packages in the libdevil package domain are unreproducible, the packages using them as build dependencies turn out, their reproducibility is affected, either positively or negatively, but but it changes with when, whenever the lib domain packages uh, reproducibility status changes. Now, what are these uh, lib devil packages? These are mostly GCC packages. Most of the GCC packages fall into this uh, lib devil package. The point I want to make here is that GCC is a different project altogether. They have their own methodology of working and you, they have their separate way of creating a pull request and then getting things merged in, in them. While uh, Debian is performing this kind of an uh, this kind of an initiative of reproducibility, uh, they must take care. They must understand that in this particular case, in one of the in one of the cases, we found that to make a package reproducible or to change a flag in GCC, if they did not make the pack if they did not make the changes in GCC, they would have to change three thousand or three thousand plus packages in Debian or their dependencies. So it totally so. It was a very, so what I want to say is that reproducibility depends on the other packages as well. And that if, if GCC maintainers take time to, uh, you know, merge this, merge this kind of change, then that those packages which depend on, on the libdevil package might remain unreproducible for that period of time. So our next external factor is the runtime dependency. Now, this runtime dependency is of the build dependency that we used earlier. So, so the runtime dependency of the build dependency is also one of the factors on which uh, reproducibility of packages depend. Um, we found out that 51% uh, of the runtime dependencies are also build dependencies. So in conclusion, what I want to say is that packages which have dual responsibilities of being runtime dependencies as well as uh, build dependencies must be prioritized for uh, becoming reproducible. So key takeaways uh, from this presentation is that crucial packages become uh, reproducible faster when compared to trivial packages. This is a good thing for us. Second thing is build path is the most influential root cause, while build timestamp has a greater frequency of issues reported. Packages affected by multiple root causes are more difficult uh, to become reproducible, and that external factors that belong to the ecosystem in which packages are built are vital to the project to be reproducible. So yeah, that, that is all I have. If you have any questions. Yeah, uh, I wanted to mention something. Uh, um, you say that the build paths, uh, uh, you discover them to be the most uh, um, influential, the, the, the biggest cause of uh, unreproducibility. No. So what we found is that uh, when we when we 
took the data, and when we tried to see how many packages were affected by which root cause, we found that more uh, packages were affected by build, uh, by build path when compared to build timestamp or any other. Yeah, right. Uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, um, the reason for this is actually that build timestamps were uh, huge issues in the past, but thanks to source data epoch, uh, they were quite easy to just basically hide them because uh, uh, timestamps were in the past included in like uh, all kinds of archives, for example, and all kinds of uh, um, files, uh, uh, mtime, whereas uh, we just have adopted the source API and that just cancelled out all of that. And Correct. after that, just build paths are just so much harder to get rid of. Right, right, I see. Okay. So it's mostly, so mostly that it used to be bigger and now it's not anymore. Basically, now it's not, it's not, not a anymore, concern yeah. anymore. Correct, because we uh, retrieved the data for 2021, so I think by then it was already uh, yeah, yeah. kind of addressed. The timestamps were huge, like if you look at the graphs of how reproducibility improved, you see that it just ticked up suddenly when we developed Correct. again support Correct. for Sutra Epoch. Yeah, I think that was around 2014 or something like that, where there was a huge spike and then... Yeah, I think 15 probably. 15, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Very, very early. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry if I missed this, but I was wondering in your study, how did you measure whether a package was how uh, whether a package was reproducible or not in terms of building it? So we we did not build those packages by ourselves. Uh, this is a data set which we got from uh, the reproducible builds uh, itself. Like Debian actually stores all their uh, results of all their packages at a at at in a database, and then we pull that database to do the study. Awesome. <laughs> Do you know why the Deb Helper is somewhat effective in the building these parts? Yeah, I, I think because for building all the packages, it's mostly used as a build dependency. Almost there, I will go there. Because uh, from some time ago, Debian had adopted something like the P Builder using CH code similar that they do, it, for example, for build systems like Bezo. So it's a very restricted environment, even control, even C groups, and everything that completely affect the building. So that's why the results are very good right now. Yeah. That's in the package config can do, can do that yet. Awesome, thanks. All right, any more questions? Thank you.